Hi, I'm Sam Laughlin, professor of physics at Rowan University. And today I want to talk to you about electrical charge and forces. Now, charge is a property of matter, just like mass. But uh, our dealing with charge is very different than what we're used to dealing with when we think about like kinematics. I mean, sure, maybe we've gotten shocked by the door in the winter time or Maybe we had static cling in the dryer, or maybe you know we had to deal with our hair sticking up after we brushed it. But it's it's something that we're not used to thinking about in, in that same kind of detail. And so today I want to try to give you some of that maybe conceptual feeling, but also to point out some of the important subtleties in how the electromagnetic force really affects our universe. So, you know, matter really comes in basically um, two types when we think about it in terms of electrical properties. So there are insulators like this glass rod where charge doesn't move Freely, whereas we also have metals, which are conductors, where charge does. Let's look at something. Um, hope you don't get too charged up about it. Um, this might be shocking to you, but you know, hey, what's a few bad dad jokes? Um, so I have this object here, which we call an electrometer. Basically, it consists of a metal rod, and on the end of that metal rod is a pair of metalized strips of mylar. Mylar is that plastic you use in helium balloons. So if I you now take this glass rod and if I rub it with this piece of silk, the silk basically takes off some of the electric charge. And if I now <clears throat> attach that to the rod, you see that what happens is those two strips split apart. Basically, the charge here moved onto the metal rod. The metal rod is now charged, which meant that since it's a conductor, the charge flows into the strips as well, since they're metal, and then light charges repel. And so the two strips are separated. And if I now bring the metal rod in, it pushes it this way or it pushes it that way. So again, you see it is uh, another case of like charges repel. Now, if I touch it with my hand, guess what? The charge goes away because I'm a conductor. Not a very good one. I mean, ask anybody who's seen the opera, but you know, I am a conductor. And so now if I start in this case where the electrometer is not charged, if I just bring this um, rod in that I have charged up, notice that even though I don't touch it, I can make those strips split apart. That's because what happened is now I have what's called done polarize this. So this is charged. This rod's charged, but remember, charges move freely in the metal. So this has uh, a positive charge. And then as Ben Franklin had basically decided, negative charge is what moves in a metal. That was uh, his idea based on some um, experiments he did for, for uh, rubbing and friction on different items. So what happens in a metal is the negative charges move. And so the negative charges are attracted to the positive charge on this piece of glass, which means that the bottom is positively charged and those separate. Now, alternatively, what you can do is if I just bring the rod to the side here, or this side, 
you can see that it actually is attracted to the side by the same reason. This is positively charged. So the negative charge is all pulled from within this rod down to the bottom part and the strips get attracted to this glass rod. Now, let's look in more detail what this happens for um, the interaction with electricity with matter. Now, we know that air is an insulator, right? Because if I hold the rod here, we don't see the charge jumping right away into the metal strips. Nothing happens. So air is an insulator. What I have here is called a Wimshurst machine. And basically, you can see it has a crank to rotate these two rods, I mean, these two discs. And these are your collectors here, which collect the charge where it rubs against the um, plastic discs. And then it's collected in these so called Leiden jars. Now, if I crank this, nothing happens. But if I crank enough, you get a spark. What's that? Well, that's basically lightning. What you have done is now you have charge moving, but moving charge only happens in conductors. Yes, you've made air into a conductor. That's called dielectric breakdown. What happens is the forces get so strong that the electrons, which are on the atoms in the air, get ripped off. And that creates such a high temperature that it, that's what the cover's from. That's where you get the light. But then it gets so hot, it expands and then collapses. That sound is basically a sonic boom. Now, what happens if I take a, a piece of plastic, like say my lunch bag here, and now crank what happens in between? And so if you notice, you're sure you still get a spark. But in this case, the spark doesn't go straight through from one to the other. It goes around the plastic. The plastic is a good insulator and has a higher break breakdown strength, which is exactly why it's used in making all the coatings and wires. Now, Talk a little bit in more detail about these forces. So, those forces are expressed in terms of Coulomb's law. That is, the force has a magnitude of k, where k is some constant, q, where q is the charge of the first object, Q2, the R, charge of the second object, and R, the separation. Um, so K has a constant value of 9 times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Now, the thing about charge is that it's measured in units of coulombs. But the thing that's interesting about charge is it's what we call discrete or quantized. That is, there is a smallest value of charge. You can keep dividing, 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 but to get to the point where you can't divide it anymore. It's like, suppose you have a billion dollars and you can divvy it up many different ways. But in the end, you can't give anyone less than a penny. So that elementary charge is the smallest charge. 
we use the symbol E. That does not stand for the electron. E has a value of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Very, very small indeed. But the electron has a symbol of E minus. And the proton has the symbol P. Now, the thing is, is that, as we talked about earlier, Ben Franklin said that the negative charges that move through um, metals, and those are the electrons, so the charge of an electron is actually minus E, and the charge of a proton is positive E. That is, the charge of the electron and proton are exactly equal and opposite as far as we know. But let's think about that in more detail. A pair of pennies, speaking of pennies. So I can clearly take these two pennies and stack them, no problem. Seems like pretty obvious, right? But it has to be because of the fact that the proton and electron have exactly equal and opposite charges. So let's talk about what happens if they didn't. So let's draw the free body diagram. It's the top penny, and here's the bottom penny. So the top penny has weight, which is down. It has the normal force from the bottom penny on it. But then if the charge of the electron and proton don't cancel out, then there's some net charge on each penny. And so if each penny has a same kind of charge, there'll be a repulsion between the two. And so there'll be an electrical force, which is going to depend upon how much charge there is on each penny. Now, we already said that Coulomb's law, we didn't need to know what the charge of it is and the separation. Well, to get the charge, let's suppose that the electron has a charge of exactly 1e. But then the proton is slightly off. I should say actually it's minus e. It has a charge of actually 1 plus delta times e, where delta is really small. It's just some small deviation from being an elementary charge. So if we want to get the net charge, well, if we have n electrons and n protons in each penny, then the net charge, Q, is therefore n times minus e for the electron plus n times 1 plus delta e for the proton. And that gives us a net charge of n delta e. Now, we just need to figure out how many protons and electrons there are in each penny. Well, back in my day, pennies used to be made of copper. Now they're mostly zinc, but let's for this purpose consider it made of, of copper. <clears throat> so the US penny 
has a mass of exactly two and a half grams. And the atomic mass of copper is uh, 63.5 grams per mole. And so if we want to get the number of copper atoms, well, that's 2.5 grams divided by 63.5 grams per mole times the avocado, I mean Avogadro number of six times 10 to the 23 per mole. And so you see that's a six and that's a six. Uh, so that's one tenth, 10 to the 22. So 2.5 times 10 to the 22 copper atoms in each penny. Now the thing is, we need to get the number of electrons or protons. For that, we need the atomic number. So the atomic number for copper, it also generally called Z, is 29. And so N, number of electrons and protons, is going to be 29 times 2.5 times 10 to the 22 which is basically 7.5 times 10 to the 23. That's how many electrons and protons there are in each penny. And so therefore the charge on each penny, Q, which we said was N delta E, well, that's 7.5 times 10 to the 23 times delta times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, which is 1.2 times 10 to the 5. Oops, that should be coulombs. Always got to keep our units. So now to calculate the force between those two pennies, magnitude of the force is going to be K, which is 9 times 10 to the 9 Newton meters squared per coulomb squared. And now each penny has 1.2 times 10 to the 5 delta times coulombs. And the distance, well, the thickness of a penny is 1.5 millimeters. So that's 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3 meters squared. And so if we do this, uh, we get that's 10 to the minus 6, 2 minus 4, 10 to the 15, 10 to the 25, and 4 times 140, so it's 6 times 10 to the 25 newtons delta square. Now, we know that these two pennies are resting on top of each other. So that means that the repulsive force from these um, two sets of pennies has to be less than the weight of this penny. So the weight of the top penny is just mg. So that's 2.5 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared, which is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 2 newtons. And so this force, 6 times 10 to the 25 newtons delta squared, which is the force pushing the pennies apart, has to be less than 2.5 times 10 to the minus 
to Newtons or in other words delta squared has to be less than 4 times 10 to the minus 28 newtons or the delta is less than 2 times 10 to the minus oops I should be doing 2 times 10 to the minus 28 delta is 2 times 10 to the minus 14. that's the worst case scenario you know that's considering that the repulsive force between these is exactly equal to the weight well we know when we bring these pennies together we really don't really feel any force pushing them apart and so that tells us that the values have to match to a very high degree that is the proton charge and electron charge have to be equal and opposite as best we can tell well okay so what well the point is is this has huge repercussions for what happens in the universe you know think about the hydrogen atom which is basically just a proton and electron now clearly the electron and proton both have mass they both have charge so there's gravitational forces there are electrical forces the gravitational force between the proton and neutron is about 10 to the minus 34 newtons the electrical force on the other hand is over a hundred newtons and so for all practical purposes we can ignore gravitational forces when it comes to the hydrogen atom if the electrical forces are so big and so strong yet what does that say about the formation of a universe because if we look at the galaxies the superclusters or even our solar system it's dominated by gravity not the electrical forces and that's only happens because of the fact that those charges are equal and opposite and so while the electrical force is actually much stronger than gravitational force it only plays a role in basically atomic sort of interactions when you're dealing with things like chemistry and biological processes and I don't think it's something we always appreciate but the electrical magnetic force is really what dominates the properties of matter and while it may not be obvious to us it's something we always have to keep in mind and uh, all the physics plays a role in what happens in our universe thank you for your time and thanks for watching